Good evening, everybody. Thank y'all so much for coming out tonight and joining Donna and me in our hometown of Amy. I look across the room and into this crowd. I see family, friends, neighbors, strangers um, who supported and encouraged me uh, since day one. Uh, and as y'all probably know, this town is where I first learned the importance of faith, family, hard work. Uh, it's where my mama, a charity hospital nurse, and papa, one of four sheriffs in our family, taught me the value of public service. I grew up here with the best, most loving and supportive siblings who worked so hard to ensure our success. And so before I go further, I want to say to Alice, to Frank, to Clay, to Andrew, to Morgan, and to Daniel, I love y'all all so very much. And contrary to what the First Lady said, Amy is where in the seventh grade. <laughs> I met a sweet, beautiful schoolmate who I knew not long after that would be the love of my life. Uh, she's obviously here with me tonight just as she has been every day since. Uh, so give me a second to brag on Donna. And I know I'm biased, I'm not objective, but she's the best First Lady in Louisiana history in my book. And as she said, there's no job description for that position, but that didn't stop her. She identified the areas that she was passionate about. She used her creativity. She got busy connecting people across the state, even across the nation, and more recently, across the globe, to work with her. And she's done an absolutely outstanding job. Uh, she is a true champion for children, for women, for families, uh, from elevating the importance of music, art, and movement in, in school, uh, to providing a supportive network for foster children and families. She's worked tirelessly to help prevent and raise awareness about human trafficking. And she's accomplished so much for our state. And she did all of that while also preserving the history and restoring the beauty of the governor's mansion. Uh, the improvements that she's made will be there for generations to enjoy. So needless to say, Donna inspires me every day. She prays with me every day. I could not have asked for a better partner in life or a better mother to our children, uh, two of whom are here, as you know, Sarah Ellen and John Miller. Uh, Samantha Bell is at the hospital. I'm expecting we'll be there pretty soon. Uh, <laughs> And my, our children have been absolute troopers. You all need to know this. Politics is, is really fairly hostile these days. It's nasty. And the family takes it much more seriously than the politicians and the office holders. But they have been absolute troopers through the last 10 years and a great blessing to us. And I love you all as well. Don and I are so proud to represent this area, to be back in our hometown of Amy. This is where we raised our children. We now look forward to being grandparents. This is where my brother, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather has served as sheriff. This is the district that first entrusted me to represent them in elective office. And I have worked hard to maintain that trust every single day in every decision that I've made. And that is why I wanted my final speech as governor to be here with you where it all began. None of our success would have been possible without the people of Amy Tanchville Parish, without the people in this room. I'll never forget the day I was sitting in the legislature and I was talking to my good friend Sam Jones, telling him that I'd had enough of the governor we had at the time. I felt he was leading us into a crippling budget crisis the extent of which we really didn't fully understand at that time. Students were fleeing the state because of the largest disinvestment to higher education in the country. Uh, one of the nation's largest percentages of working poor people were being deprived of health insurance that was readily available if you just said yes. Business as usual politics was holding us back. So I looked at Sam and I said, I'm running for governor. Now, not many people believed that I could win. But choosing the path 
was never about power. It was never about proving a point. It wasn't about politics. Truthfully, it wasn't even about me. It was about people, people like everybody here tonight. And I'm so proud of this room because this room looks like the state of Louisiana. You know, the, <laughs> diversity is important to me. It always has been important to me. And I'm proud to say that we have had the most diverse and the most competent administration in state history with the cabinet, the boards, the commissions, the staff that look like the state of Louisiana. And I would say their quality is inextricably linked to that diversity. Now let's go back to 2016. It's a little unpleasant. But let's talk about the challenges that we've met, the progress we've delivered over the last eight years. Because my story is your story, and I want to tell all of you of what we've been able to accomplish for Louisiana by working together. And every single thing we've done in contrast to what's happening across the country and certainly in Washington, D.C., has been on a bipartisan basis. Uh, now, spoiler alert. We're going to wrap up, and I'm going to tell you that our state is much better off today than it was eight years ago. And this is true. This is true in numerous critically important and objectively verifiable ways. And in fact, I'm going to tell you we're not just better because in some ways I was a pretty low bar. <laughs> We're the strongest and the best we've ever been in many, many of these measures. When I took office, the state had a $2 billion deficit and a grand total of $400 million in the budget stabilization fund. I'm leaving with a balanced budget and more than $3 billion in two reserve accounts. The Budget Stabilization Fund, also known as the Rainy Day Fund, now by itself has a billion dollars, more than it has ever had in our history. And there's another fund that didn't exist until 2016, and we created it. It's the Revenue Stabilization Fund. It has more than $2.2 billion in that fund. The news keeps getting better. Last year, we ran a $300 million surplus that will be available for the next governor and legislature. We have $91.4 million excess revenue in the current fiscal year, and the forecast for next year went up by $100 million. We have addressed the fiscal situation of our state. And simply put, we are in excellent financial shape. Uh, and these savings have been accomplished while we are investing in our critical priorities again. We're paying record amounts to the pension systems, unfunded accrued liability. We're retiring debt. We're paying judgments. You name it. Uh, I want to talk about education for a moment. You know, the primary reason I ran for governor in the first place was because of those disinvestments. Well, we've given teachers a total of $5,300 in raises and $2,650 for support workers. We have significantly increased funding for early childhood education. In fact, more, more state general funds more state general fund in the current budget for early childhood than ever in our history. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off script for a minute, a minute. We all want better educational outcomes for our kids. Yeah. Yes. If we will just keep investing in early childhood for a generation and see those kids get all the way through school, we will be there. We will be there. We're also making higher, I'm sorry, historic investments in higher education including an increase of $465 million in recurring funding for operational expenses of our community technical colleges and our universities. And we're doing this through honest budgeting practices that are fiscally sound, uh, budgets that adequately fund our most critical priorities. Uh, we've operated state government in a cost-effective, efficient, in transparent manner. How do I know we're the most transparent administration in history? Because Bobby Jindal, Jindal wouldn't sign the bill, including the governor's office in those transparency initiatives, until he was on the way out and I was on the way in. I'm the only one that's ever, <laughs> ever operated on it. <laughs> 
But that's to better serve taxpayers, to attract new businesses and investors, to ensure a high quality of life for the people of Louisiana. Uh, and that is a huge difference uh, from my predecessor's days of smoke and mirrors budgeting, uh, fund sweeps, one-time money for recurring expenditures, incessant budget cuts, only to be followed by mid-year cuts. In contrast, here as I walk out the door for the last time, we have produced surpluses every single year that I've been running. So I think it's appropriate that I pause for just a moment and thank Jay Darden and all the people at the Division of Administration, the wonderful staff for that excellent work. And over the last eight years, the growth of the state general fund has been less than inflation. Because sometimes when I'm out talking to groups and I'm talking about how we gave teachers pay raises, how we expanded Medicaid, how we have grown our investments in early childhood and higher education and all these other things, I say, well, that's fine, but how much did you grow government? By less than the rate of inflation over the eight years. And we're making progress on other fronts, too. I'm very proud to say that our unemployment rate is the lowest ever measured for the month of November, 3.5%. Unemployment has never been as low in this time of year than it is right now. I'm very proud of that. And by the way, we keep beating our own records month after a month. I'm also proud to tell you that in the third quarter, Louisiana's gross domestic product grew faster than 45 other states at a rate of 6.6%. .6%. The national rate was 4.9%. Our real GDP was higher than many other states, including southern states like Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, North and South Carolina, Virginia, and Florida. And I can name them again if you want me to. <laughs> Look, something else I'm really proud of is the fact that we replenished our unemployment trust fund. Uh, you know, coming out of COVID, that, that fund, had, fund had been depleted with that rapid rise in, in the number of unemployed uh, Louisiana workers. Uh, and there's a law that says if you go below $100 million in the, in the trust fund, there's a solvency tax on businesses that the state has to impose. Well, because of COVID, we were certainly headed in that direction. But I insisted that wouldn't happen. We came together. Uh, we replenished the fund without taxing employers more. That fund today is at $924 million and forecast, the forecast for August of next year, I'm sorry, August of this year because we're 2024, is almost exactly where it was going into COVID, $1.1 billion. Um, and we're making monumental investments in critical infrastructure. Uh, we've allocated nearly $5.5 billion to more than 2,000 projects around the state, including nearly 7,000 miles of road improvements. And by the way, while we're on the topic of transportation, Louisiana certainly has not been shortchanged by the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, this was the most uh, important piece of legislation and infrastructure to come out of Washington since we did the interstate highway system. But based on fund formula funding alone, Louisiana will receive $7.5 billion. That's 16th in per capita funding formula. By the way, we're 25th in the country in per capita population, right? So we're 16th, uh, and that's 12th in, in, in resilient funding uh, that we've received. And, and let me just tell you, we are, we are putting those dollars to work uh, for their highest and best use. Uh, over $10.1 billion in bipartisan infrastructure law and Inflation Reduction Act funding has been announced for Louisiana. Uh, this includes $1.29 billion for resilience of infrastructure, much of which is allocated to protect Louisiana's coast through grants to CPRA, but also through direct federal spending by the Army Corps of Engineers. And speaking of the bipartisan infrastructure law, we committed years ago to closing the digital divide by 2029. Uh, that was a result of a task force that I created uh, to study rural areas of Louisiana uh, the, so that we could revitalize those areas. And one of the things they came up with at the top of the list, we've got to make sure there's high-speed affordable internet all over our state. 
Just a few weeks ago, I announced that Louisiana is absolutely leading the country in putting that bipartisan infrastructure law broadband funding to work. We're the first state in the nation to receive our funding allocation, setting a model for other states. That's $1.35 billion that our state will have to end that digital divide by 2029 so that every residence, every business in the state of Louisiana has affordable high-speed internet. Now let's talk about the progress we've made in economic development. We've announced more than 261 economic development projects representing $94 billion in capital investment across our state. Those projects will result in the creation of 80,000 plus direct and indirect jobs. Uh, we've expanded programs to create small business contract opportunities with the state. We're supporting women and minority uh, entrepreneurs, promoting small businesses owned by military veterans and Gold Star spouses. I see a military veteran right here in front of me uh, tonight. Thank you very much, Lewis, for being here. Hudson Initiative expenditures with disadvantaged businesses increased nearly 300 percent between 2016 and 2022, from $32 million to $90.5 million. In 2016, I signed an executive order to rein in and reform the industrial tax exemption program that was more generous than it needed to be. So now, instead of the 100 percent exemption from ad valorem taxes, property taxes that ran for 10 years, it's now an 80 percent exemption for a five-year term with the option for another five-year term if the manufacturer meets all of their obligations. And we tied this exemption to job creation and we gave locals a voice. This is especially appropriate because it's only local dollars at issue. The state doesn't levy a property tax. And there were fears that these ITEP reforms would reduce capital investment in the state. But not only were those fears unfounded, they were exactly wrong. ITEP projects average $10 billion a year pre-reform, and post-reform, they've averaged $25 billion, giving local governments a say in whether their property taxes are exempted has it proven extremely beneficial to communities and to the state. In fact, locals have realized more than $750 more in revenue to fund police and fire protection, education, local roads and bridges than they would have had we not reformed the program. Louisiana's manufacturing jobs, the gold standard indicator of economic health due to their positive ripple effect across the economy, ended 2022 at their highest level in seven years. Uh, we have successfully implemented an all of the above energy strategy that leveraged the only climate action plan in the Gulf South to drive new in energy investments while continuing to support companies that meet current market demand for oil and gas. Uh, just last week, the EPA gave Louisiana primacy in Class 6 well permitting, just the third state in the nation uh, to get primacy. And this will allow us to reduce CO2 emissions, grow the economy, and create jobs, all in furtherance of our climate action plan. Thank you. And the result of these efforts is that Louisiana is now a global leader in the energy transition and a major international player in the booming LNG market. Economist Lauren Scott predicted a few weeks ago that Louisiana will add 80,000 new jobs in 2024 and 2025, thanks in large part to the huge investments we are seeing across the state in clean energy projects. Uh, we capitalized on coastal restoration efforts to establish Louisiana as an international water management industry hub anchored by the water campus in Baton Rouge. We've completed 72 projects, we started 82 more, and we have procured $12.5 billion in coastal funding. We're diversifying our economy. We've supported investments in emerging sectors such as tech, cybersecurity, life sciences, aerospace, and reinvestments in logistic assets like the $1.8 billion Louisiana International Terminal Container Facility at the Port of New Orleans. And I'm immensely proud that my first act as governor was to expand Medicaid. Today, more than a half million of our working poor Louisiana brothers and sisters have access to health care who otherwise wouldn't have it. And I've said this many times before, and I'll say it again here tonight. 
Medicaid expansion was the easiest big decision that I made in the Office of Governor. Because of that decision, our uninsured rate is now below the national average. The state has saved money that helped address our fiscal problems. Hospitals and other providers are better reimbursed. And across our state, not a single rural hospital has closed. That is a far cry from the situation of some of our neighboring states. In 2017, we advanced bipartisan criminal justice reform. We reduced our incarceration rate from 760 per 100,000 in 2016 to 564 in 2021, which is the latest data that we have. And I said we would do this when I ran for governor, not knowing if I could deliver, but on my way out the door, I can tell you Louisiana does not have the nation's highest incarceration rate. We enacted data-driven reforms based on best practices focused on nonviolent and non-sex offenders. And we did all this while also overcoming some of the worst natural disasters in Louisiana history and a global pandemic. And speaking of the pandemic, I'm just going to tell you, all you become governor, I guess you signed up for what comes your way. <laughs> that one was hard. <laughs> that one was really hard. But I will tell you, we were blessed in Louisiana to have truly wonderful and competent and caring public servants who were experts in their field at the Department of Health, in the Office of Public Health. And I want to thank Dr. Courtney Phillips. I want to thank Steve Russo and Dr. Joe Cannon. If it looked like I was calm and collected, and somewhat knowledgeable, it was only because of their tremendous work. You know, somebody counted these up, but there were over 244 emergencies over the last eight years, right at 50 state emergency declarations, and more than 20 federal disaster declarations. I don't know if that's a record, but FEMA told me they can't find any state that's ever had that number. And we've met every single one of those challenges. We've delivered progress for our people. And before I conclude, I, I, I know that I have here tonight um, so many people who worked in the administration, people who have served in the legislature, people who have served on commissions and so forth. From the very bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for your service. You all have just been terrific. Um, and one of the greatest blessings that I have known is, the, is just having the ability to work with you all, to know how much you care about the state and its people, to see you get up every day and go to work, to make sure that we can say the things that we're saying tonight. Um, and in particular in the room tonight are the two people who've served as chief of staff for me, uh, Ben Nevers, who was my senator uh, for 12 years, eight of which I was in the state house, and we worked together in the legislature, and he served as chief of staff that first four, um, first four years, I'm sorry, first year. It seemed like four, didn't it, Ben? <laughs> um, and just did a tremendous job, um, despite the very difficult circumstances. Thank you, Ben. And then, for seven years after that, Mark Cooper has been my chief of staff. I don't think chiefs of staff ever last seven years. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for your wonderful friendship and your work. I look across the room and I know many of the folks here today were present when I gave my first inaugural address at the Capitol in 2016. In that speech, I talked about how my West Point education and Army experience influenced the way that I think the way that I govern. Um, in military terms, and we all know this, victory is won by getting timely and accurate information. Uh, you've got to formulate a sound strategy and you've got to employ the tactics necessary to succeed. I endeavored to employ that formula in every decision that I have made, 
from COVID to hurricanes to the budget and everything in between. I looked at situations from every perspective and collectively with the best advisors a governor could ask for and made decisions that I felt would best serve the people of Louisiana. And one thing I can tell you, for good or for ill, we never looked at a poll to tell us what we should do to address these situations. Never one time. In that first inaugural address, I quoted General MacArthur's farewell address to West Point when he said that in challenging times, leaders have to work to build courage when courage seems to fail, to regain faith when there seems to be little cause for faith, to create hope when hope becomes forlorn. Little did I know how much those words, so ingrained in me during my formative years at West Point, would ring true as I embarked on this mission of leading our great state over these past eight years. But more than my military experiences, I leaned on my faith. Some people have called me the crisis governor because of all the challenges that we faced over the past eight years. When I took office on January the 11th of 2016, none of us could have predicted the obstacles we would have to overcome. But God knew. He knew what was ahead. I put my trust in him, and I will be forever humbled that he and y'all saw fit to entrust me to lead and to serve Louisiana during those trying days. And my prayer at the beginning of this journey, and really every day since, was that of Solomon. But I'm going to use my words. And I know Brother Rodney has heard me say this. Just give me the wisdom to know the right thing to do and the courage to do it. Together, we have righted so many wrongs. We built on the future while maintaining what makes Louisiana great. The sugar cane still grows. The Red River still flows. Tourists still flock to Mardi Gras. The Tanchebo pair of strawberries are still the best in the world. <laughs> the good times still roll. And yes, we have challenges to be sure. But this beautiful melting pot of cultural gumbo that we are blessed to live in has never been better. We did put people over politics. And without question, by almost every available metric, we leave Louisiana much better than we found it eight years ago and stronger than ever in many, many respects. And as a result, I leave the governor's office as optimistic as I have ever been about our future. After all, the breeze of hope is still blowing. And I have every faith that that will continue. Louisiana, I will forever be your humble servant. But for now, and I say this to all my friends here in Amy, I'm coming home with a grateful heart for the opportunity that I have had to serve this wonderful state and all the beautiful people who inhabit it. God bless you all, and God bless the great state of Louisiana. Thank you.